a dead horse. As always, I am your host, Sean McKenda. And Watashi wa Jakuson Kata Des. Son, we are in America, and you will speak American <laughs> when you are spoken to. Um, you know, it's actually, it, it's it's even better, because even if I were introducing myself in Japan, uh, by doing the full Watashi wa there, I'd look like a fucking weirdo. <laughs> <laughs> we're back. We're with, we're with more weeb shit, uh, which basically means that I am immediately out of my depth. Uh, and I know people are going to immediately come back to me and be like, no, you're actually a weeb. Look at you playing a JRPG, to which I will go, I have not watched an anime in a year. I mean, that's that's a that's a fair statement. I mean, especially compared to your humble co-host who is waiting for a job interview to go teach in Japan. <laughs> So, um, definitely different levels of weebdom here, but you knew that already, uh, dear listener. Um, and I imagine that our suggestion this week, um, coming from, uh, our, 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 our good friend, friend of the show, Edgar, um, was meant partially, like 60% at least, I'd say, for, for me. So, <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I, I could see a little bit going my way as well, just because, uh, my Twitch chat, my Discord did a, a viewing of, uh, a silent voice a couple of weeks back. Uh, that went really well. Uh, and I really liked that movie. So I could see why they'd be like, well, let's follow it up oh, and make you watch another sad anime. Oh, I didn't realize that was the movie you guys watch. Yeah. I couldn't make it that day. So yeah. Uh, quick aside, a silent voice, great movie. And I will probably make reference to it throughout this podcast i will not be giving any real spoilers to that movie but like go watch it it's good i think it's better than this we're talking i want to eat your pancreas uh which we should clarify is not let me eat your pancreas which is the live action version of i want to eat your pancreas which is based on a book there's a lot of levels of pancreas in this one there there really are i actually i actually almost watched the live action version on, on accident i'm like wait a minute someone told me this was an anime and then i looked again and i was like oh okay um so yeah um i mean as far as how i felt about the movie it was cozy. I enjoyed my time with it. If you want, if if someone asked me if they should watch it, I'd probably be like, "Yeah, sure." <laughs> <laughs> um, there's, I've seen quite a few of these uh, kinds of movies. Uh, quite a few of them anime specifically. Actually, I've read quite a few books like this. Uh, the whole cichlid thing was a um R- really quick. I, I do need to clarify that he said sick lit as in sickness literature. Uh, the first time Jackson said sick lit uh, in the call, I didn't mention this to him, but I definitely did think of the candy or like the headband. And I was like, what the fuck does a sick lit have to do with anything? No, I, I didn't even realize this. So yeah, sick lit is kind of the informal word for this genre, I suppose. Um, uh, th- and and it it became pretty popular in uh young adult fiction again after John Green's The Fault in Our Stars came out and was a big success. They made a movie about that, um, which I also watched on a plane. Uh, so you know I I enjoy myself a sad, cichlid romance. They're 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 kind of formulaic. They're all kind of the same, but I can't deny that it's a formula that speaks to me. Um, but in terms of being formulaic, this one didn't do anything particularly outstanding in that regard. Um, the characters were pretty broad. They had the arcs that you would expect them to. It had the themes that you would expect it to. Really, the most cozy thing about it was that it took place in, like, a, like a teenager, like, summer vacation, which is, like, a, like, a setting that I find especially cozy, and so, you know, I like that shit, I like Japan, you know, I just, I was literally snuggled under a blanket while watching this, um, and it was, it was a good experience, but I can't say that even within its genre, this is the story, or even more specifically, the anime that I would point someone to first. There, there are similarities to Anohana is 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 probably a good comparison point. Twelve episode series, 
that's pretty popular. Uh, if you haven't seen that, I think it does more interesting stuff than this movie does. It's not quite the same. And in particular, uh, I was also thinking about, because we're going to, I imagine we'll be talking about the main character in this, and for a similar arc with more complexity and more engagement, more nuance, um, I would really recommend something like- A silent voice? Well, I'm sorry, wait, I'm sorry. I I think I cut you off there, but I don't know for sure. (laughs) I actually have not seen a silent voice, so, uh, but I'm going to take Sean's word for it. Um, and uh so if like social isolation uh like that that kind of character if that's something that appeals to you definitely watch march comes in like a lion that's one of my favorite anime of all time uh and it, yeah so big old big old okay on this one <laughs> I mean, I'm going to, I, I immediately came out the gate saying that I liked a silent voice more, and I'm going to stand by it. I didn't hate this movie. I'm pretty much going to echo Jackson's sentiment to a T and say it was okay. Uh, a little bit different reasons for why I didn't connect with either of the characters in any meaningful way. I didn't particularly care for either of them. But the movie is very good at making you feel what it wants you to feel. Uh, So there were times I definitely got misty-eyed. There were times that I definitely, like, welled up with emotion. Uh, It never really broke through in any real capacity. Mostly because I spent the entire time wondering why I was feeling the way I was. uh, Which is not a good thing to be feeling in a movie. Uh, If you have the, the faculties to ask yourself, why am I feeling this way... You have, in my opinion, basically been manipulated into feeling that way. Uh, And I I know I mentioned before on the podcast that, like, I view all film and all media as a form of uh, emotional manipulation. And, like, that's, that's what it is at its core, and that's what it wants to be. And that's a good thing. But when you can so easily pull it apart and say, you're not manipulating me through character development or character building or anything like that. You're just, you're just sad. That's nothing. That's not That's not something I want to engage with. You know, I want to be sad because I watched characters that I grew attached to change and man- grow and do things that you do in cichlid things like this where I don't really want to say it because it's kind of a spoiler, but also, I mean, what the fuck do you think is going to happen in this movie? Um, I, I mean, do, do, he, he says that she dies in like the first five minutes, doesn't he? Yeah, I was just going to say that, too. I oh, forgot okay. about that yeah. until, I, like, as you were saying that, I'm like, oh, yeah, he does do that. Um, but, I mean, the point I'm making here, more than anything, is just that, like, I I didn't care. Like, yeah, it made me emotional, and I have to give it credit for that. But, like, it was never at the expense of a character or at, like, a, a, a truly dramatic moment because of something I cared about happening. It was because they, they said something. Like, at one point... One of the characters mentions their dog dying as a child, and I'm like, oh no, not that. And like, I'm like, wait, hang on. Fuck you, movie. All you said was a dog died, and it made me upset. That's nothing. Yeah, so. yeah. And I mean, uh, that's that's a big problem with a lot of these. Um, uh, cichlid's kind of a subcategory of, of what I would call tragedy porn. Um, where the whole point is just to make you sad and make you cry, and I don't think there's anything wrong with that. Um, just like that, you know, there's a lot of movies that only exist just to make you laugh, uh, you know, a lot of movies that only exist to make you excited, but the thing about those kind of, like, simple, broad, single-track emotion kind of movies is that, like, the, yeah, they'll work on you in the moment, but, like, there's nothing there for you to, like, really chew on or really think about or really consider, um, and I think that the the problem is particularly pronounced. I, I, I feel like, um, this is, this is maybe something interesting to talk about, because I feel like people are more forgiving of a, like, a comedy that just makes them laugh as opposed to, like, a tragedy that just makes them cry and doesn't have the same meat and I don't know if that's a fair observation. Uh, I was actually thinking about that. Like, as I was pa- ha- handing the baton over to you, I'm like, although that, that comedy, that's kind of a weird juxtaposition with this. Yeah. So so here's my guess. Um, and and I, I think in general, 
like, because this is this is also like to a degree. This is sort of what I keep complaining about about like the Disney blockbusters, right? Like it has one emotion, which is fun, and nothing else. Uh, you know, I mean, granted, that's a generalization. There are better movies with more to them, uh, but uh, that's something that we keep coming back to again and again on the show. And I, so I think why, um, I think why people tend to be a little less tolerant of it in like sad dramas is because they're dramas and we sort of expect there to be a weightier focus on the characters and a weightier focus on like theme and conflict and stuff like if you're like in the end you're still getting like one emotion and there are plenty of people who just like to be sad and i you know i mean again like i enjoy some good tragedy porn time time and time again but i think you know there are good comedy is that addition to making you laugh will like give you something to really like chew on there are good like action movies that have like a little bit more to say aside from just like spectacular set pieces and in that same way there are a lot of dramas that in addition to making me cry uh like give me give me something to really uh really stew on and think about i mean really it's it's you know you can apply this to horror too there's your jump scare funhouse movies then there's the horror movies that like make you sit and like really consider uh something dreadful in the grand scheme of things so i i think like you know that really the movie's biggest problem is that it's shallow and that if you've seen a lot of you know the, these kind of like tragedy porn movies with a little bit more depth, it can kind of be like, eh, you know, there wasn't really that much point to watching this one in particular. I, I think, like, my whole reason why I personally find, uh, like, jump scare horror movies are a, a big pet peeve of mine. Like, I really like a good horror movie. Um, and why I, you know, I think a sad movie in the same vein is because both of those things can be emotionally draining. And, like, at the end of a movie, if you feel uh, just exhausted, but, like, for really cheap reasons, it doesn't feel good. Like, when I finished something that's sad, I want to be sad and drained and point to a reason why and say, like, I, it just it resonated with me. As opposed to just, like, okay, well, now I'm exhausted. I just watched a movie that made me upset. And I don't care about it. That fucking sucks. It's the same with, like, jump scares and stuff like that. Like, yeah, I've been scared the entire time, but who fucking cares? There was no meat or sustenance behind it. I'm just tired now. Fuck yourself. <laughs> <laughs> and, like, like I, just, I just need something more than just exhaustion at the end of it. Like, I think that there is something to be said for a good movie that leaves you exhausted. But if I'm just exhausted and drained for cheap, 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 cheap. I don't want that. Yeah. Um and and I and I guess to to be to be a little more fair um to to this particular movie because you know we we've we've been picking on it and we'll keep picking on it. Um, but <laughs> what yeah. us? No. No, never. So unless you're Jesus Christ vampire hunter, I don't think we've ever not picked on a movie. <laughs> At, le at least one of us has. I think you're right in, like, every episode. <laughs> um, so, the first thing is that this is also an adaptation. Um, and I I suspect... Layers of pancreas. Layers of pancreas. So many layers of pancreas here. And I suspect that some of the stuff that feels kind of shallow or underdeveloped, um, like, knowing that it was a novel going in first... I could, like, see little plot threads that kind of don't really go anywhere for the sake of... And, I mean, this is, this is you know, something to the movie's favor in its own right. It's a nice, lean, like, hour and a half. It doesn't feel like a real waste of time. Um, but at the same time, there are some weird plot threads that don't really go anywhere and some other, like, outside stuff that I imagine was set up and developed a lot more. Some um, characters that just kind of feel like they're going to be important and then, eh, you know just occasionally offer gum yeah uh and, and, and so like even that stuff um like in in the form of a book like if we're talking about our protagonist and we'll talk more about him like i imagine this was first person narration and maybe like he really is just as broad um and kind of basic an archetype in the book uh i suspect that 
there's a, we have a little bit of the like Twilight adaptation problem going on here, and that even though the character of like Bella and the Twilight books was already pretty broad, um, the fact that they had to shoot a movie where they couldn't have all the narration took you know what little character she had and like completely sanded it down into nothing. And I fuck you, that Puma tackle was the most <laughs> characterization ever put to film. <laughs> I knew everything I needed to know about Bella in that one second. I mean, you knew everything you needed to know about that movie in one second. (laughs) Uh, Except for the fact that there'd be an hour and a half of the most boring movie I've ever watched in between (laughs) that and the good part. (laughs) So, um, so yeah, I kind of suspect that's happened here. Uh, And also... We'll, we'll talk a little bit more about this. I There's some stuff... When you're watching anime, it's always good to keep in mind that you're watching something made by a different culture and very pointedly made for a different culture. Um, and I think that in this case, there's some stuff that would be a lot more resonant to a Japanese audience that, like, as Americans we don't really understand why it would that would be a big deal or seems kind of self-evident. So I'll give you I'll give you an example here of, of like even a small thing that makes this disconnect that's not a spoiler. So the main character there's much to do about the fact that like the main character reads Jackson, a, Let me let me cut you off real quick. Yeah, because yeah. I know what you're going to make. I know what point you're going to make. And that is at one point the main character puts on a fedora and is treated <laughs> not like an insane person. <laughs> I forgot about his fucking fedora. <laughs> I laughed so goddamn hard. <laughs> that's, a, that, that's actually a good example, though. Um, the one that I was thinking of that stuck out to me is especially weird, though, because it was so important to the characterization, was the fact that, like, characters kept chiding him for being, like, a bookworm, for, like, reading a ton of books. And, like, that's that occasionally... Like if you if you're talking to a real meathead, like that occasionally comes up here. But like normally you hear people say like Americans are so dumb, like they don't read. Like and you know, especially like a high school student, like being really into reading is something that would probably be celebrated by at least some people. But like in the way that the movie talks about his reading habits and the way that the characters discuss it if if you have that little bit of extra background it makes more sense in that because reading is like such a solo activity and he takes it to the point of being an otaku which has a a little bit of a different definition to what that word means compared to how we use it here uh where it basically just means anime fan an otaku in japan is anyone who is like obsessed with something to the point of like neglecting everything else in their life have I ever told the story on this podcast? I know I've told the story to you back when we were living together of uh, my friend who took a Japanese <laughs> class in college. And at one point, like they were in a classroom with a native Japanese speaker who was teaching the class. And she made a comment about how you don't want to be an otaku in Japan. And like a kid stood up and went, I am a proud otaku and you can't take that from me. And she just looked at him and went, no, that's a bad thing. Sit down and like just move past it. I to be a fly on the wall in that classroom. Every time you tell the story, I imagine him like tie, like boldly tying his Naruto headband to his head. Like Joseph fucking Joe star. <laughs> Fuck that kid. Holy shit. <laughs> so, right. Right. So, like, in that light, the fact that, like, you know, he is such a bookworm to the point that he, like, it prefers, like, conversations with fictional characters more than real people is something that would be considered a huge problem, especially in the context of Japanese culture, where they have a big problem with uh, hikikomoris, or, you know, we might more informally call them shut-ins, people who have disengaged from society, the fact that culturally, generally speaking, um, the collective unit of society is is s- emphasized over the uh, interests of the individual. Um, again, talking in generalities here, uh, but with that th- with that in mind it makes a little more sense that like 
these two characters having conversations about what it means to like be uh this is this is one of the things about the movie i'd say that um made it stand out a little bit like there were a few parts a few conversations that i liked and one of them was this conversation about how um like the the main the main girl is kind of jealous of the main guy for having a sense of self outside of the collective um, because I thought they were going to go a complete textbook Manic Pixie Dream Girl and say, like, she just wanted to, like, make his life better. Uh, this, but they only went 98% textbook Manic, Manic Pixie <laughs> Dream Girl. So, um, yeah. So there's there's those elements to keep in mind, too. So I'm sure it plays better to its native audience, and I'm, I'm willing to bet that there's more meat to the original novel. As it is, though, the adaptation, it's pretty, and it's comfy. <laughs> And that's about the best that I could say about it. I have to wonder what is wrong with the live action version. Because in trying to find this movie, which it's very hard to find, I stumbled across the fact that the anime is like an 8 out of 10. It's pretty well rated. The live action's like a 2.1. Really? I have several questions. How? What's the difference? I, I, I'm very curious. I'm curious if it's just, like, bad acting or, like, a bad translation to screen. Um, that that would be my guess, is that whereas, like, the anime gets, like, the best thing about the anime is kind of those, like, tangible details. Like, you know, the colors, the, um, the music, the coziness. I would guess that the live action version is just kind of cheap and, you know, stilted. Like a lot of the like live action anime adaptations are like live action attack on Titan. Live action attack on Titan was a disaster. (laughs) Oh my God. (laughs) Do people still talk about that movie in any way, shape or form? Because like I saw that in theaters, I think with you. No, I was, yeah, we went, we saw it together. (laughs) Do, do like, I, I have, no connection to like the weeb circles like i've got some friends who are in it but like i don't really talk to them about it it does the live action attack on titan still get discussed because i feel like it should um i feel like it should too but so generally speaking with these live action adaptations the because there are a lot more of them than you would expect um and the fact that there are so many of them they all tend to be cheap and they all tend to be bad um they tend to get glossed over outside of like the first month that they're released uh whereas like the the difference being that like when an american adaptation like your dragon ball evolutions or your ghost in the shells comes out that's a bit more notable because that went through like the hollywood system and is like you know a big enough property to get the full adaptation whereas like they'll make a live ad- a- action adaptation of out of literally anything in japan so fair shake i was just genuinely very curious so no yeah i mean like did you know there was a uh, a parasite live action movie i don't think i did I feel uh, like I might have stumbled across that at one point. I know there's multiple Danganronpa stage shows. I know stage shows are a big thing. Stage shows are a big thing. Um, lo- and I think I think especially with Netflix, like one of my uh, one of my favorite shows that um, like I, I, I guess I'm gonna out me as basic because people don't talk about this show so much anymore. Uh, but Erased got like a live action Netflix series. Um, nobody talks about that. I mean, nobody talks about the original anime anymore, even. So, um, yeah, there's there's a lot of disposable live action adaptations for sure. All right, do you want to talk spoilers? Let's talk spoilers then. Let's go. Let's go to the nitty gritty details then. Well, before we do, as always, go give us reviews on iTunes. Go follow us on Twitter, bdh underscore cast. Go tell your friends about us. Go support our Patreon, patreon.com slash bdh cast. And next week, we're going to be talking about No Country for Old Men. We threw a bunch of suggestions into a random number generator. Uh, It pooped out No Country for Old Men. And so that's what we're doing. Somehow we managed to dodge not one, but two Fent Forestick entries (laughs) and get something good. Thanks, sweet, merciful Jesus. I'm excited. I've been meaning to watch this movie for a long time because I've never seen it. So um, I'm thankful the random number gods were favorable and we did have to watch fucking Fent Forestick. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, I'm curious to see it. It's it's a movie I've never seen. It's one that I actually haven't had a huge draw to watch. Like I've always been kind of curious about it, but I feel like this is like, the time that I would have watched it. So no country for old men next week. 
So, so, so let's go into spoilers then. Um, so, you know, obviously the girl dies, and that makes us sad. But why didn't it make us that sad? <laughs> why didn't it make us that sad? Do we want to... Are we talking... Are we, Jackson? Yes. Are we talking the big twist? Oh, we're talking the big twist right here, right now. Because uh, I, I think it's a good... I actually think it's a good jumping off point for several things. So, uh, so the big twist... She doesn't die because of her pancreas. She gets stabbed. <laughs> In the fucking heart. And if you uh, are joining us now having not seen the movie, yeah. Yeah, your reaction to that is about what my reaction to that was, which is to say, I'm sorry, what? Um, Because as we were watching this movie, uh, about a scene before she dies, I go, oh my god. They're not going to kill her via her her pancreatic disease. She's going to get hit by a car or something. Uh, And then, yeah, she gets hit by a car or something. In this case, she gets hit by a knife. Um, But it's (laughs) it's the same principle. (laughs) I I wonder if they used a seesaw effect to drive the knife into her. (laughs) Um, Okay. So let's unpack this this twist for a bit. Um, all right. So starting starting with the positives. Starting, I'll, I'll start with the one positive. Um, all right. I, what what positive can you can you twist from this? Like the knife in her chest. Twist this into something better. <laughs> so the one positive thing is that I think as a story beat, having her die in a way that isn't her pancreatic disease, I think that works. It's not especially bold. It's not especially mind-blowing. But considering, like, the concerns of the characters and, like, her trying to be treated as a person who isn't, like, just dying because anyone can die at any moment. Like, that underscores that. So, like, yeah, if she just got, like, trucked by a bus or something, I think it would be fine. Um, but... <laughs> <laughs> um, so, th- th- this is another thing. It comes back to something we were talking about pre-spoilers in that there was another thing they could have done to make this twist more sensible because, like, she gets stabbed. But, like, we don't see a scene of her getting stabbed. Like, we find out when the main character does over, like, newscast footage. I rolled my eyes so hard at that, too. Like, that is just a cliche. Yeah, for sure. So, what I was sort of expecting, I was expecting some sort of follow-up. And this is my this is my prediction. You know, someone who is familiar with the source material, if there is anyone out there, can tell me if I'm right or wrong. I'm actually genuinely curious. But my prediction is that you know, they do finger quotes set this up <laughs> earlier in the movie. In the loosest possible terms imaginable. So we have a lot of, um, like, TVs talking about, like, the uptick in crime, like, some fatal stabbings that are going on. And that was the th- sort of thing that struck me as kind of weird, like, something that the book probably lingered a little longer on, um, espe- especially because... Uh, there was a period of time, I don't know exactly when the book was written, but there was a time when, like, Japan had, like, an uptick of, like, weird, specific violent crimes that was, like, a big concern. Um, oh, right around the time of Persona 4. Um, oh, uh, I, 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 it, it I'm making just a joke about Persona. I, that, it might have been, though. You might actually be right. <laughs> I mean, I might be, but also I am just trying to make a persona joke. I'm sorry. <laughs> Never mind. I'm going to go sit back in my not a weeb corner uh, and marinate on the fact that I'm not weeby enough to make relevant jokes. Ba, 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 da, <laughs> so, and, so, so, so while Sean's in his corner, we'll talk, we'll talk more about weeb shit. Like, that's the sort of thing that feels like even when it started happening, that, like, would have had more importance in a book. And so what I expect is that we would get some sort of follow-up, like maybe the the main character is driven to know like who was responsible and like does a little bit digging and she find and he finds out that it was the guy that that uh uh the girl confronted earlier because earlier in the movie there's like this asshole like trying to con this old lady uh and she kind of sticks up for her for her and kicks the dude in the balls and runs off and so my guess is that in the novel like that's connected to just like the general uptick in crime and that like after humiliating him like this guy is tied to like the yakuza or some shit and he comes back and he stabs her uh and like we find that out but we don't find that out in the story so it just plays like 
she randomly gets stabbed and it's not built up with any sort of drama. We don't see it's her. It's not like getting hit by a car. She got hit by a knife. It was she, just a random <laughs> happenstance. She she, she seesawed herself into a knife. Um, Whoopsie doodles. Uh, yeah. So there there were a few ways that you could have made this play better. Uh, more set up, actually dramatizing the scene. Like, you know, she goes down, like, a bad, like, back alley because, you know, X thing happens and has to do all this other stuff. You could, it, it didn't have to be so random as, like, getting stabbed. Um, but here we are. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it is wild. Yeah, I I don't really have much else to say other than that. Yeah. Um. So why don't why don't we shift gears then and talk about talk about our main man, our 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 main squeeze protagonist boy, uh, who is a pretty stock character, uh, very much, you know, aloof and withdrawn and distant, and then you know he meets he meets a peppy. Equally broad, equally uh, well-trodden character, peppy, spunky, adventurous girl who goes and takes him on all sorts of adventures and buys him beer and they play truth and dare and then then she gets stabbed and he learns a valuable <laughs> life lesson about ourselves and each other. You don't understand. It's deep because she's living even though she's dying and man, he... He's living like he is dying. <laughs> and that's that's basically the problem with all of this kind of cichlet, in that if that's all you have to say, like, get in line, dude. Like, there's so <laughs> many fucking stories with that with that life lesson. And, and so when it's played so straight, that's what that's what makes it a little bit like, yeah, okay, like whatever. And there are um there are a few other weird things that like keep us keep us for for rooting from rooting for this guy because like i so like i was expecting i wasn't expecting something great but i was kind of surprised when we got nothing at all um i was expecting some sort of reason that like he was so aloof and distant let me take over uh, i'm i'm going from here this this is this is my territory now <laughs> you're um, in my house now <laughs> Hell yeah, because uh, I just want to talk about uh, kind of how I took this character um, and kind of where I saw him at, especially coming hot off the heels of A Silent Voice, which is a better movie and actually has characters and shit. Hell <laughs> yeah, what a concept. Um, so, in A Silent Voice, the main character is very much in the same way in that they're very re reclused from society they're not trying to get close to everybody uh this is kind of embodied through the, he sees x's on everyone's faces saying like don't connect with this person they're just going to hurt you uh and like early on in the movie it's revealed that it's a trauma related to the fact that at one point he was in like second third fifth elementary school grade range uh and bullying a deaf girl uh and then it came back, it bit him in the ass, and he basically stopped trusting people. Like, and he looked at it as penance for his actions. Like, hey, I was a shithead to this deaf girl. I bit me in the ass. I need to be a better person, and I don't feel like I can trust people anymore. A really interesting, solid premise. You know, like, that's that's a character. That's not just, I like books. Uh <laughs> <laughs> Which is what this guy is. like. And so A Silent Voice does a very good job of establishing why this person's the way they are, how they treat themselves, how they view themselves, how they view the world, and like the, the situation that got them to the point where they are now. Which gives them backstory and prevents them from feeling creepy. Which, this is where it's going to shift over into an American interpretation of it. Uh, and where I am at in my worldview as opposed to where Japan is at. And this is not to say that, like, the original interpretation is not the correct answer, and, like, this is also going to kind of overlook a lot of Japan's cultural identity to it, uh, but I think it's still worth exploring as an avenue, not necessarily a true critique, but maybe something that's just worth mentioning about, um, because... 
there's a lot of incel vibes off this guy. Uh, not in the way of he is angry, uh, which is what we were kind of talking about in pre-discussion. Jack is like, I don't really see those incel vibes just because he doesn't really have a, an angry attitude to him. And and he's right. Jackson is entirely right in that regard. Uh, and that there is not a lot of... He himself does not read as an incel. As much as he kind of reads how almost incels would see themselves. Um, and I say this coming from a point of view of someone who at one point in their life would have thought like, I can be cool and aloof and distant. That's what I can do. I can be cool. Uh, and like, someone's going to come and sweep me off my feet and it's going to be awesome and shit. And like, girls are going to recognize me for who I am. Truly a nice person. I was not a great person in high school. Um, this is not something that, if you listen to the podcast, that's not something that should be new. I don't think I was a terrible person, but you know what? I've learned. I've grown as a person. I'm not afraid to say that I could have been better. Um, <laughs> so there, there's a lot of identity that I saw in myself and like how that could have reflected, especially if I had continued down a, a, a worse path. So like, Watching this, there's a lot of, as I said, incel vibes. And that can get backed up by the fact that her ex-boyfriend, someone who is viewed widely as a nice guy and someone who cares about people in the class and everything like that, oops, he's actually the asshole. And the creepy dude is actually the nice guy. What a concept. If only the Chad stopped dating the Stacys, <laughs> am I right? Uh, and then there's the bedroom scene oh oh the bedroom scene this is this is definitely the biggest incel vibe scene i, I was in, in a movie that i would overall describe as comfy this was very not <laughs> yes um in that at one point she i the, the the motivations of it i think are ambiguous at best and like i think there's some clear identity with that throughout the movie is like we get to the end she's like oh you know i don't know how i felt about you and clearly there it felt like there was a moment there where she actually did want to pursue a romantic tryst with him uh but then kind of backed away from it and like the ambiguity of whether she was entirely kidding from the beginning or whether she was not is up for debate and i think that there's some interesting elements to that moment of it the following moment where he gets mad because he's not getting any um and pins her to a bed and like holds her there hurting her in the process that's a little icky big yikes big yikes yeah i, I wouldn't have as much of a problem with the scene because like like you say um i mean you know the 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 virgin versus chad like why does chad stacy like chad that's that's as old as like however long there have been people who we would consider nerds, you know, or, like, creeps or outcasts or what have you. Um, and so, like, that's not especially unique to this movie. Uh, and not that this would be a great plot point, but it would certainly be easier to swallow, like, if he just got, like, frustrated and stormed out and she was like, well, hey, like, what's the big deal? And it was more of, like, an emotional thing. But the fact that uh, we get some really rapey vibes with, like, the pinning her to the bed is... Uh, Big, big no-no, big yikes in an otherwise pleasant movie. <laughs> and, I mean, you're right. Like, the the, the Stacy Chad bullshit uh, is definitely a thing that's been around for as long as time itself. Like, fucking Revenge of the Nerds and all that bullshit. Uh, but, like, I think that it's one of those things where we've just come far enough into current year argument um, that... It, it, it's getting harder and harder to swallow, you know? So, like, when yeah, I see things sure. like this, it, it does, even if it's not, it, like, it's definitely not clearly an incel story, barring that, 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 that scene, that, that scene. scene. Um, there's just enough vibes to it, given that we've moved past that for the most part, uh, especially in, you know, American culture and cinema and whatnot, and, like, stories like that are often looked down on is like, Really? You're doing this? It's not 1984 anymore, pal. What the fuck is wrong with you? Um, so I think that there's some questions raised by it. But no, I do think in general that Jackson in, in, is right in that it's not really an incel story. There's just some some vibes to it. And the fedora doesn't help. 
<laughs> I was actually just about to say that because for what it's worth, I was I was I was thinking about this on and off throughout the movie too. Um, I think that the 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 slightly the slightly more familiarity with like the the cultural stuff maybe clued me into like what the actual or what the presumably the authorial intent is maybe the author is a giant and so like who can truly say death of the author but um like so but like there were definitely a couple times particularly during that scene the fedora like jokingly i was like oh yeah haha that'd be like but wait actually though um and so basically i think what it comes down to for me and what makes this um pretty pretty much the bedroom scene notwithstanding uh, uh, a, a a harmless enough version of of that trope is that the main character's attitude is so much more just like bewildered and 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 cold and not so much like angry or vengeful i think i think that plays a big part in it it's still tropey it's still not great even even just from like a enjoying the movie perspective because it is such familiar ground at this point um but like it, it definitely it's enough to keep the movie from feeling like an incel manifesto or something for me. Like, it wasn't written by, like, Elliot Roger or whatever. <laughs> see, as I said, though, the thing is, like, I, I can see a, a certain subset of people viewing themselves as the cool bookworm lingering in the back of the class type of situation. Uh, like, a, a non-insignificant subset of the incel, even if they're angry online at, at, at the WAMs. Um, but like in public, they're like, oh, if only someone would come and save me, if only I'd get my own manic pancreas dream girl and I'd be fine. Um, you didn't laugh at my manic pancreas dream girl. I changed pixie to pancreas, uh, and I'm just worried that it didn't land. So I wanted to explain it to you. See, I didn't understand the joke. I'm glad you've, you've come and given me this galaxy brain explanation. I, I, sometimes I know that if my jokes don't land... It's not because they're dumb and bad. It's because people don't understand them. I am very smart. <laughs> yeah, no, but no. I mean, I, I, I totally get what you're saying. Um, I, I think that, uh, I, I think that this, this sort of character, it's, it's a little bit unavoidable because as much as we would like for, for young people to get it, they're not going to. <laughs> um, and, and I think that. Like there is, there is some value in like a be be more open and be more like social and connected with the world. I think that like a lot go of go di- watch a silent voice. Yeah, yeah. Like I think a lot of the dialogues that the characters have with each other here are pretty good. And I and I like this. I'm I'm sort of mixed on the main character because on the one hand, I kind of like that. Um, I I, I kind of like that the the movie doesn't necessarily rely on like kind of the one inciting incident that like explains why he was who he was, but he's just not enough of an interesting character to make that like feel like a real three dimensional person either. So it ends up falling pretty flat. Um, yeah. Uh, I mean that's that's really just the the movie's problem, and that like you can have you you can have your tropes, but if you just play them completely straight, they're tropes. They're well-trodden ground. People are familiar with them. That's why you twist them. That's why you turn them. That's why you add a dash of this, a dash of that. Make it more nuanced. Make it more exciting. Make it more personal. And uh, just, just, just didn't get that. Just very, very shallow surface level writing. Yeah. I mean, that's really what there is to it. I guarantee, like, the incel vibe is all largely incidental. Once again, that scene notwithstanding... Uh, and if you take that scene out, I don't think that, like, I think even, like, the, the underlying potential for an incel vibe would have been pretty much something that I would have hand-waved away of, like, eh, you know what, I'm just projecting in some capacity or making something up that's not actually there, uh, and, you know, it's, I, I'm fine with movies that are, like, go make friends, go branch out, don't just, you know, live to yourself type of thing, um, but, you know what? That scene is kind of a linchpin in this, and it's it's in the movie. Like, you can't say it didn't happen. You can pretend, <laughs> but you can't say it didn't. <laughs> well, I think I think that'll about do it. I think we hit all the important points. I think so. I uh, I'm Sean McKenda. Find me on Twitter at Sean underscore McKenda. Uh, I'm on a hiatus from Twitch right now, so, I mean, 
help us underscore Skippy if you really want to. I'll be back maybe in a week or two. We'll find out. I don't know. I might just take a break for a while. Uh, my writing's over at 25yearslatersite.com. You should also go listen to the audio articles they've been releasing this year. I have been editing a lot of those because that's kind of what my new role entails over there. So go check that out. And I've been Jackson Keller. You can find me over on Twitter at twitch. Not Twitter. Fuck Twitter. You can find me over on Twitch at twitch.tv slash Jackson J. Keller. I don't know why I got into this here cowboy voice, but you know what? I'm sticking with it, partner. I really wish you wouldn't. Well, yeehaw. Just salt my biscuits. I love this boy. <laughs> All right, I'm done. <laughs> I was going to say you could follow us at BADH underscore cast on Twitter or support us on Patreon uh, at BADH cast, but I don't know why you would anymore. I thought we had a good conversation. I thought we had interesting things to bring that like, you know, if you're so inclined to spend a dollar to get access to our discord or $5 to get access to the backlog of our bonus episodes that are all really, really good. Or even if you're really feeling it, 10 bucks a month to like request bonus episodes this would have been an episode that could have maybe convinced someone to do it. And then you did that and fucked it up. Well, Sean, here here's the real, like, galaxy universe brain thing that I just did. We were talking a lot about cultural differences today. We were talking a lot about Japan versus America, East and West. Um, and what is more American? What shows that we're a wholesome American podcast than a Texan cowboy accent? <laughs> Thank our $10 tier. I'm not even going to engage with you on that. Thank our $10 tier. Uh, well, partners, I hope you all had a lickety-split good time. Thank you so much for giving 10 of your hard-earned dollars to us, Julia, Travis, Mom, Aunt Summer. Y'all are great. Keep uh, keep paying to keep the lights on, partners. <laughs> Anything Jackson says past this point, I will edit out. Thank you to Lords of the Highway for the use of our theme song. It is Suicide Alternate Take Off the album High Octane Low Expectations. They're a wonderful band. You should go check them out however you can. Support them, buy their music, go see them live, whatever you got to do. And thanks to 25yearslatersite.com. Uh, there's a little button of us on their site you should go click on, but also you should go read their articles. They got a bunch of really talented people doing a bunch of really talented writing for movies, TV, news, music, reviews wrestling if you can think of it they probably have something on it and yes i am talking fast because if i stop jackson will start talking and i don't want that to happen so also next week as i said we're going to be talking about no country for old men uh bye it was relevant we're doing cowboys next week